Welcome back to Political Paradigm. My next guest is a member of the House of Representatives, representing Adokoko Badigbo, Federal Constituency of Benue State, Honorable Philip Abese. Welcome to Political Paradigm, Honorable. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for your patience. And I'd like to congratulate you on winning uh, your election. Uh, you're going from human rights activists to uh, politician. How's that been for you? It's just about two weeks in the House, or two weeks, I believe, or three, as a member of the House. How's that been for you? Well, it hasn't been an easy one, but I want to thank my people uh, in the first place for finding me worthy to represent them. And uh, by God's grace, I'm putting in my best, working hard day and night to make sure that I don't disappoint them. Uh, coming from uh, the human rights background, particularly uh, activism uh, into politics, it is not an easy one at all because uh, in human rights you have a legal framework uh, where things uh, work perfectly well and uh, your efforts are quite uh, understandable. Uh, but in politics, it's actually a different ball game. You have uh, all manner of people from diverse backgrounds. Uh, conflict of ideas, conflict of interest, but in the end, you still have to make sure that uh, you get something out of it. So, so far, so good. The last two weeks have been very challenging. Uh, by God's grace, we are pulling through, and uh, not just our best, but I think Nigerians are beginning to appreciate a little input in what uh, we are trying to do. This is your very first shot at politics, right? Yes. And it's interesting that you would win this election. And I ask this because, um, and not just you, uh, in the House of Representatives, 10 out of the 11 members are APC in the Senate. Uh, ten, uh, two out of the three are also APC, I believe. And then the APC won the governorship seat. And the concern is, before then, the former governor was a member of the People's Democratic Party, who was the leader of the APC at the time when he was in the APC. So could you talk to us about how the APC was able to reclaim the mandate of the people in Benue State? Uh, let me correct this impression quickly. Uh, the former governor was at no time the leader of the party. Uh, the leader of the APC... Not even as governor? No, not even as governor. Uh, in the, the, the APC has a structure, just like the ANC of South Africa. That structure is not broken by virtue of people's uh, political uh, uh, positions. Uh, in, um, when he came on board, he actually left the PDP, he ran. Uh, people formed the APC, people who were in CPC, ACN, uh, or the legacy party that put together the APC. He wasn't a part of it. Uh, he went, he joined them, he was given the mandate. But he never understood the philosophy of the APC. Our party's philosophy and ideology is about the masses, is about the people. And uh, he came with a very wrong notion. Uh, he, he managed, managed narrowly to win his re-election in 2019. And uh, again in 2023, the people gave a total uh, sweeping uh, order that he wasn't, he, he wasn't not just part of the APC, but the fact that uh, his ideology uh, was not in tandem with the yearnings and aspiration of the Benue masses. And uh, we saw the result. He lost his senatorial election. Uh, he lost the governorship. He failed to, to uh, impose his prestige on the people. And uh, even the presidential election, the APC won. What that means is that uh, our party, the All Progressive Congress, has uh, a mandate, an ideology that uh, the people of Benue State are quite at home with. It is not about shouting, it is not about the cry of headsmen, killings and all of that, but delivering, you know, meeting, you know, the needs of the people. And uh, that is exactly what His Excellency, the governor, is doing. The leader of our party in Building State is His Excellency, Senator George Akume. He's still our leader. Currently, he's the Secretary of Government of the Federation. And uh, we're all working together under his leadership to make Benue a better place. Throughout his reign between 1999, and 2007, when he was governor of Benue State, he did quite a lot for the people. And that is why any time he, he's at home, people are there. But the Benue people have continued to miss him. And that is why after he left office, he has produced three other governors. Even though the first and the second didn't marry his uh, philosophy for the development of the state. But the people, you know, are beyond every reasonable conviction, you know, still understand that, yes, it was his making that these people who came after him couldn't. And they uh, were believing that uh, the current governor of the state, uh, who came from a different background, and they pledged his allegiance to this ideology, 
uh, to our mission statement as a political party will do well. Uh, he has started, uh, we're seeing his moves. Uh, the Benue people are already applauding him, even though some of us believe that it is too early. You saw the suspension of the local government chairman that was done by the State House of Assembly. In the history of the state, about 80% of those people who were local government chairmen before their suspension, you know, were the worst, you know, as far as this country is concerned. The level of naked looting that took place uh, at the local government level, shameless stealing of public funds, you know, broad day theft and robbery of the people. And there's some of them, in, in our own case, in my local government, he even engaged himself in terrorism activities, you know, escalating insecurity and so on and so forth. So what the State House of Assembly has done, uh, the people of Benue State are happy. And then as a lawmaker, because I'm a lawmaker for everybody, we are not looking at it from the perspective of uh, political affiliation. We are looking at what has happened and what they have done. So, so far, what the State House of Assembly has done is in tandem with the spirit of the Constitution. We'll continue to monitor. If they veer off, we'll call them to order. But so far, so good. I think they're on track, and the governor has also done well to give life to the suspension of the chairman for proper investigation to take place. You talk about the relationship with the, within the APC in Benue State, and it raises a question, is the APC in Benue State really as united as you say it? And you talk about the leadership of uh, the SGF, uh, Senator George Akume, and also commend the governor for what he's doing. You, all, you, you appear to be sort of on the same page with all of them or both of them to be specific. But are they on the same page? I ask this because of how the election in the State House of Assembly played out, where they individually had their own candidate and the governor's candidate emerged eventually. Well, aside uh, His Excellency President Ashwaju Bolame Tinimbu, Senator George Akume runs one of the largest political family as far as this country is concerned. And uh, sometimes uh, the winner or the loser of the State House of Assembly election were all members of the same political Family, we all belong to the uh, Akume School of Leadership. Uh, for us, it is a family affair. We have gone past that. We, we have moved on. Uh, we are discouraging dis divisive tendencies within the party and even in the governance of Benue State. And our leader, the Secretary of Government of Veterinary, has cautioned us. He has said, let go. Let us focus on delivering. Because at the moment, Benue is crying. Benue is weeping. We need to, you know, to, to restore joy and hope back you know, to the people of Benue State. And uh, if we want to focus on who got what, uh, who didn't get something in the recent uh, State House of Assembly election, I strongly believe that we'll be defeating the ideology of the George Akume School of Thought, and they uh, won't be able to deliver. And again, the leader of the party, he had warned us when we all came on board, he invited us, he told us, you know, he encouraged us on the need for all of us to work together, both the National Assembly members to work together with the governor, on the need for us to work with President Ashwa Jubala Metinibu, the State House of Assembly. So he, he has continued to encourage every one of us to work together, and they want to see that happening in the next few days. So irrespective of anybody's errors in the last uh, few weeks, we, we, we have put that behind us, and then we have moved on as a political party to see how best we can move Benway to the next level. Very well, then. Let's, let's look at um, the National Assembly now. You were, as a first-timer, you were part of the G7 movement. You supported the G7, uh, and you believe that somebody from the G7 should emerge as speaker. Eventually, you would throw uh, your weight behind uh, the current speaker, Tajuddin Abbas. Uh, could you explain um, your experience as a first-timer in the process leading up to the election of the speaker, going from being a supporter of the G7 and then supporting Honorable Tajuddin Abbas, Abbas Tajuddin. Well, um, when we came on board, uh, we were exposed to uh, certain uh, political permutations within the House. And I want to thank members of the Ninth Assembly. They were there as our guardian angels. They played a very vital role in honing us just within the shortest period of time. Uh, my respect goes to members of the G7, particularly uh, His Excellency uh, Idris Wase. Uh, and uh, right honorable Aliu Betara, you know, th these are very great guys, team members of the house, you know, carried everybody along, worked very hard day and night. They wanted to be, to lead this, the, 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 the tent assembly, the house of reps. And uh, by God's divine uh, way, 
Uh, it fell on uh, His Excellency Right Honorable Tajuddin Abbas, the current speaker. Uh, at first, we were not happy with the decision of the party. We wanted a situation where uh, the political space will be, you, you know, will be widened for everybody to participate. But along the line, the president engaged people. The candidate, the anointed candidate, also equally engaged people. And one thing we, we, we must, you know, uh, reaffirm, one thing we must, one truth we must tell the Nigerian people is that at no time did any member of the G7 castigate the personality of Right Honorable Tajuddin Abbas. No. Our struggle at the initial stage was never against Right Honorable Tajuddin Abbas. With his uh, academic credentials, with his, uh, with, uh, with his programs, uh, mission statement, even his uh, uh, legislative experience and activities that he has carried out in the House before now. No. Nobody at any point, you know, said anything about that. It was just about the process that gave birth to him. And then what happened? We didn't just leave this side to drive towards that direction. No. Right Honorable Tajdin Abbas is somebody I'll call a, a politician by excellence. He engaged the people. He engaged members of the G7 in a conversation. He engaged the members. He reached out to everybody. And you have seen, apart from the vote that he got uh, uh, 353 votes on the day of voting, uh, right on Rebutta Judin Abbas has been able to carry the house along. Yeah, did he engage the uh, Deputy Speaker and Honorable Aminu Jaji? No, he, he, he did. You see, uh, right on uh, Idris Wase is a very principled person. He was trying to make a point. And I think that point he has made. And after making the point, you know, two, he said it on the floor of the house when he received the nomination that he will stand for democracy, to deepen democracy, not out of hatred for the candidature of right Hon. Tajuddin Abbas, but for the fact that, you know, in a democracy, people should be allowed to express themselves. And he expressed himself. Some of us, we belong to his political school of thought. We know what he told us before that election. He spoke to us. And after the election, he still reached out to members of the House to galvanize support. And uh, in our last two sittings, he has been very supportive. He has been very supportive. He has been helping uh, uh, the leadership of Right Honorable Tajuddin Abbas, you know, to carry the house along. You know, in the last two sittings, he participated actively, you know, to making sure, you know, that we have a rank of free house. Today, what we are having in the House of Rep is more or less like what they used to have in the Senate years back, when the House of Representatives used to be thrown into turmoil. You have people bantering fighting and all of that is beginning to happen in the Senate. But now the House is a collective whole, one peaceful entity. Everybody is working together to see how we can achieve the legislative agenda of Right Hon. Tajuddin Abbas. We are working in synergy with him to see how we can deliver, you know, on our oversight functions, you know, to support the executive. We are also working collectively and individually to see how we can meet, you know, the hopes and aspirations of our people who in the first instance voted us to become members of the National Assembly. Uh, Honorable, sir, you, as, a, as a new member of the House of Representatives, what are your interests specifically? Because we've followed you in the past uh, couple of weeks and uh, your motions and interests seem to be uh, sort of not accepted by the people. But let me hear from you firsthand. What are your interests as a member of the House of Representatives? Well, like my background, I'm coming from the human rights dimension. And one of the core issues that have led to violations of human rights in our country today is the issue of insecurity. Uh, I strongly believe that uh, when the House is uh, reconvened and uh, we commence our full legislative business, we'll be very, very supportive of Mr. Speaker in working hand in hand with the executive to ensure that we all fight insecurity and wipe it out of this country because insecurity leads to humanitarian issues, it leads to abuses of human rights and all of that. Having said that, back to my motion on the floor of the House, which has to do with, uh, uh, I think what was actually wrong was the heading and the understanding of my colleagues. Uh, we, the, the motion was uh, to address uh, the causes. It wasn't to stop people from traveling abroad. For God's sake, nobody, you know, will do that. Nobody will say uh, people should be restricted because that is a violation of their fundamental human rights. And uh, the world is a global village. People want to move here and there, you know, to do either for business, for pleasure, for medical treatment. But again, coming back to that motion, the, the letters of the motion, the spirit of the motion, we, 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 we have identified, you know, the brain drain 
that is happening across the country, many people refer to it as Jagba, you know. And uh, Mr. President, even in, as part of his campaign promises, told Nigerians that in his administration, he will ensure that he addresses those remote causes of the Jagba syndrome. And in his word, I want to quote him that there will be Jagbada, meaning that people will be forced to return back to the country. And what are those things responsible? One, I've mentioned the issue of insecurity. I recall many years before now, people used to travel from Abuja and Lagos to their villages just to spend a nice time with their families. But today, people are no longer able to do that because of insecurity. The roads are not safe. The village itself is not safe. They are no longer free of uh, criminality, such as kidnapping and even a uh, banditry. So if we address this issue, then we go into the economic angle. Our doctors are leaving the country. Nurses are leaving. IT experts are leaving. Why are they leaving? Poor uh, uh, living conditions of work. So how do we address this issue? I, I cited an example the other day. For instance, the government has uh, signed the student loan bill into an act, and uh, now we are very sure that our students will be able to get support from government to go to school, buy textbooks, read in school, pay for their accommodation, and will be able to pay later after they have left school. So think of this. When we, uh, as a government, decide to give our medical doctors in this country a certain allowance for their upkeep, for their accommodation, and say, so this is accommodation allowance for certain level of professionals. What do you benefit to run away from Nigeria to Germany or to London for medical treatment? And when you open your eyes in London for medical treatment, you meet an Emeka or a Shegun treating you. A man was trained in Nigeria, he ran away from this country, either because of insecurity, because of pay, or because of lack of social amenities. So if we address these issues, and these are the things Mr. President has promised to address. So that motion was actually a call to duty. Did you live in the UK at some point? Yes, I was in the UK for seven years. I studied at my first, second, and second degree in the UK. Why did you go and why did you return back? Uh, well, uh, my academic uh, program, the way I started and how it ended, is, is a bit complicated because I started uh, as a scientist. I studied in University of Hillary for four or five years. I read biochemistry, but graduated without a certificate. And then much later, I had to go to the UK to study law. I needed to fulfill my passion and other things. So I went to England. I read for my LLB in the UK. I did my master's in human rights, and I did my MBA. I, in fact, I had shortly commenced my PhD program before I returned to Nigeria to answer the clarion call to serve my people in the National Assembly. So in the UK, you have this uninterrupted academic calendar. Having wasted four or five years in my formative years as a child between the age of 18 and 22 when I was in my first university, I needed a, a, a quick solution. One, to get education, to be properly trained, and to equally be able to join my peers in the society so I don't lose out completely as a young person. But, but beyond returning to the country, from the UK because of politics, what else would have made you return? I have something here to offer the Nigerian Do people. Do you think that the climate, the Nigerian climate, gives opportunity for Nigerians? Because that almost suggests why Nigerians are leaving, and that's the brain drain you talk about. Yes, you see, I have something here to offer my country. I have something upstairs to give to my generation. But you need, you, you, you need to be tough to be able to do that in this climate with a little effort of government in the right direction. I strongly believe that many persons who also have something upstairs to offer the people, you know, will also be able to return back home. So many of these doctors who are left here are in America as the best doctors in America. During the COVID, we saw the contributions of Africans abroad. You know, when they came out to rescue the COVID situation, even in China, some of the doctors there are Africans. And today, Nigerians are traveling to India. So what are the issues? Is it medical equipment that we don't have enough of them? Don't we have good hospitals? So these are the issues. Mr. It, President has already promised to address this issue. Quickly, so just that before we go, I don't, was think, a call to duty. I don't think that it would be left to the president alone. As a lawmaker, uh, but your motion was shut down. Perhaps you say that the wordings of the motion could be responsible for why it was shut down and why it was perceived wrongly by Nigerians. So you could come in the form of a bill. Is this something you would like to address in the form of a bill to sort out this whole uh, 
migration issue? You, you, you see, for now, um, it is one aspect we have been able to awake people's consciousness to the fact that something is going wrong somewhere. We have woken the president and the, the, the executive to eat. State governors have called me to commend me on the motion. Uh, the International Office for Migration have equally called to see how we can further sensitize the people on the in intention of the motion. I think for now, I want to leave the motion. It may come back another time again. There are also several other bony issues Very you well know, running my head that I have come to address as far as this parliament is concerned. And I wouldn't want to dwell on a particular motion to make the situation look like this young man from Benway. The only thing he has he has to offer the people is just this motion. By next week, I intend to present four bills before the House. Uh, I'm presenting a bill on uh, the North uh, Community Development uh, Agency because today, uh, a state like Benue, we produce limestone, Yandef in Boko, my community, Igumale, and other local government area. People are taking limestone uh, 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 from this community. You go to Obajana in Kogi State, they are taking limestone in Zamfara, they are taking gold. These things are controlled by the federal government with just uh, a directive that these companies should carry okay. out corporate social responsibility. Very well, and very nothing has taken place in respect of this. So right. I have several bills, I have several other motions we'll that are in the pipeline, we're, and we're, they are going to come up any moment from we'll now. So the, we are done with the Jackman motion for now. Honorable Philip Agbese, thank you very much for your time. And I wish it's you well thank you as so the first time. And as it's encouraging to see a young person in Parliament. Thank you so much. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Time. Thank you so much. Well, I've been speaking with Honorable Philip Agbese. He is a member of the House of Representatives, representing Ado Okoko Gbadigbo Federal Constituency of Benue States. And that's a wrap on Political Paradigm today. Remember to catch this episode and others on YouTube. Simply search Political Paradigm or go to channelstv.com. I'm Terry Ikumi. Goodbye.